So, Hal, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ben. No, my pleasure. I'm really, really excited. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us and taking out the time to chat. Um, I've got a lot of questions planned for you. You've got a really interesting uh, career. You've done a lot, seen a lot, and been around the ecosystem for for a long time. Uh, but I always like to look backwards and start at the very beginning. So wh- where did your interest in IT uh, come from and, and what did your kind of education and early career look like? Um, the interest was, uh, I would say, I wouldn't say forced, but was brought to my attention um, both my uh, parents were bankers in India, and um, they were part of the early, um, you know, modernization of the banking system. And they were both selected to uh, introduce computers into their their banks uh, or the bank that they worked for. And I remember my father coming home one day and saying, "You're going to learn how to use these things because this is what's going to run, you know, everyone's future." And it was like. It was the summer of seventh grade, and he signed me up for these computer lessons, which were starting to, you know, take uh, hold in India. And I only went because uh, all of the classrooms and the labs were air conditioned, and you could spend from nine a.m. to like seven p.m. And when it gets to like one hundred and twenty degrees in summer in India, where I came from, trust me, that was the best place you could be. So I had very, um, very basic motives <laughs> to learn computers, which was the air conditioning, but um, you know, one thing led to another, and then um, I did some extra work uh, on computers during my college years and uh, undergrad years. Uh, I did some, you know, freelance work, jobs, etc. And then after I graduated, um, that seemed to be the only uh, path forward. Um, I originally wanted to be an aerospace engineer, and when I when I did not get an acceptance into an aerospace engineering program, uh, that door was shut. And uh, looking back. I'd say it was a smart decision. So, so but what did you study? So I actually studied uh, a bachelor's in uh, electronics uh, and somewhat of electrical engineering uh, work. So um, that's what I did. It was it was an undergraduate program where we, um, you know, mostly studied things about AC DC motors, transistors, things of things of that nature. Uh, my final semester elective was actually in radar systems. Um, which was a godsend for me because um, I used to love airplanes and then to have an elective that allowed me to study how radar systems work was great. I enjoyed every moment of it. But as with any EE program, there was a fair bit of programming involved. And, you know, we had a final semester paper, which had some level of uh, programming. Pascal, I believe, was the language that we used uh, back in the day. You know, one thing led to another. I did some extra computer work during my undergrad years. Uh, learned how to code in C, C++, you know, 4GLs like DBase, uh, Fox Pro, etc. cetera. Uh, and that's, <clears throat> it seemed to be the only option after I graduated. Let me put it that way. So your your first role was as a programmer? That was your you, you move into the workforce? Uh, my first role in my life was actually as an instructor uh, teaching uh, people how to program. Um, and, um, it's, it, it's something that I've held very near and dear to me, um, for all my life. Uh, I love mentoring and coaching, um, and teaching because, uh, I think it helps you learn and, you know, get better. Like even today, if I'm teaching someone something and if I've taught something in a certain way, someone will ask me a question that will force me to take a, you know, like a, maybe a 15th look at the same problem. And then I might come up with a new way to solve it. Um, so it's something that I've always loved doing. But that was my first role. My first role was actually uh, working for this firm in India where um, we built computer curriculum, capitalizing on the boom that was taking a hold in, in, in southern India for uh, computer coaching of uh, all, uh, you know, types. So. So then how, how did you transition into, I guess, I'm presuming that would then move into a delivery-focused role in your career? I um, I was an independent consultant slash developer for a long part of my career. Um, I would say almost until, um, uh, until I started my life at Salesforce um, or my employment at Salesforce, I was actually somewhat of an, like an IC slash independent contractor. I learned a lot of things along the way, you know, Java and um, a lot of EAI technologies is a platform called C Beyond, which a lot of people who came from that time know about it. But you know, I, I don't know if people remember it anymore. 
um, and all of the, the the boom in the app servers like WebLogic and WebSphere and so on, I learned how to run those platforms, operate them. So for a long time, I would say up until 2000, um, I would say mid-2006, um, I was um, an independent contractor slash consultant doing a lot of hands-on you know development design um, in fact my contract role prior to me starting my career at Salesforce I did development design production support it was the closest thing to a full stack uh, uh, developer slash DevOps person uh, that you could think of and I don't think DevOps or full stack was actually a term back then um, but that's what we did. Like you know, I, I worked for um, a car manufacturer as a contractor, and we pretty much myself, under the guidance of an, a more senior resource uh, and a couple of additional like you know temp uh, uh, staff org resources, uh, we pretty much ran the entire integration platform for this car manufacturer here in North America. Um, it was a lot of fun. You know, I mean, your day could be writing code, talking to the business, or you know, doing production support uh, at night. You know, I've done weird stuff like, you know, cut over from WebSphere to WebLogic or deploy, you know, new JVMs on Red Hat Linux and um, learned a lot, like, you know, the nuts and bolts, so to speak. So so if you look back at your early career now, are there any lessons or, or moments that you think kind of set you up for success? <clears throat> yeah, I would say... Um, Obviously, my father recognizing that computers were going to play an, an oversized role in my life was definitely one of them. Uh, the second one was um, a friend of mine uh, brought me into a job. Uh, I, I would say my, my first year of undergrad, like the summer after the first year, um, where we, um, we would go door to door selling a new brand of soda that was being launched in India. So um, that taught me, um, I mean, it's like 120 degrees and you're going literally from store to store trying to convince them to stock your brand. And um, the deal was that for every 10 crates of soda that we purchased from the distributor, we got 11th crate free. And that was our margin, basically. So we would sell 11 crates, but pay only for 10. And then we would divvy up the money. Um, that taught me a lot, actually. Um, I, I would say that's... That taught me the importance of there's a time in your in in everyone's life where you focus on learning, not so much on what you get out of it in in terms of money and things like that. I probably lost money on that job because I would take an allowance from home <laughs> just to you know fill gas in my motorbike and stuff like that. And I don't think I ever paid my folks back <laughs> that money. So it, it was not a very well run P and L, but it definitely taught me the the value of. Um, you know, going door to door and grinding it out. Um, in fact, it's something that evolved into me um, when people would later on in my career ask me, like, what's your secret for a long career? I was like, you know, like, yeah, you can be brilliant, but um, most people actually make long careers out of attrition. Like, you really need to have the ability to, uh, you know, last it out there if you want a long and a fruitful career. If, if you're going to pack it in. Um, um, I know this is an Asia pack uh, podcast. I'm going to use a cricket term. Like, I think careers are like test matches, right? You, you've really got to dig in for the long haul. It's, it's not like a 2020 game of cricket, which is done in like, you know, a couple of hours. So uh, that, yeah. I think those are two big things that I learned from my early career, which I continued. On my first job, um, I actually learned a very important lesson in life. The job that we had uh, was with the startup, um, you know, with the, with the education and, and, and the person who was running that startup had finished his master's in the United States and come back to India. Uh, and he was a big fan of, uh, you know, uh, Stephen Covey and uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, things of like that, you know, the book. Uh, and the one concept that I took away from that and I, I hold dear to my heart even today is, you know, the circle of influence versus the circle of concern. So um, I try to always focus on things that are within my influence and not really worry so much on things that are concerning, but not something that I can influence. Um, it's wasted calories, mm -hmm. in my opinion. So, Yeah, 100%. I think that's a good lesson for anyone uh, at any stage of their career, right? It's uh, what can you control 
how can you control it? And uh, there are so many factors uh, that you can't control. And uh, back to your your, your cricket uh, mention, like you are going to get a few ducks throughout your career, right? But oh, absolutely. it's about staying resilient and, uh, and, and keep plugging away until you get your next century. I mean, the best of them bat at what? Like a 52, 53% average. Like that's like just a little over one in two two shots like yeah that's a pretty i mean i would say most most people with a decent middle management career are probably doing much better than a 52 percent average so um you know as far as sporting analogies go I, i'd say yeah that's that's very accurate you're going to get a few ducks uh, in your life and you just got to you know come back the next day show up the next day and and keep going so absolutely so when did uh, when did you first hear of salesforce um, when did I first hear of Salesforce? Um, I would say mid 2006. Um, I had not heard, I knew what CRM was because I actually worked on the CRM and integration platform for North American, uh, for a car manufacturer here in North America. So I knew the concept, like I, I, I understood the concept of CRM, but I, I'd never, and I kind of knew a little bit about Siebel CRM, which was like the de facto standard at that time. But I had not heard of Salesforce until one of the recruiters uh, reached out to me and um, started talking to me about this new company and they have professional services and they want to expand into the enterprise. And they felt that my knowledge of integration with web services and backend systems would be valuable. Uh, plus the fact that I had some domain level knowledge, like I understood what a lead meant, for example, like, you know, you didn't have to explain that to me. So they, they felt that it was a good fit as their enterprise team, consulting team was getting ready for, for growth. Um, that's when I, I first heard about Salesforce. I had some, you know, um, I'm a first generation immigrant from India. I, I, I came to the United States to work uh, on an H-1B visa. And so I had some visa, you know, status things and, um, really my first meeting, I told the recruiter, I'm sorry, I, I can't even talk to you right now. Maybe call me back in four months or if my situation changes, I'll call you back. And sure enough, like my paperwork moved from one step to the next in, you know, two and a half months after our first conversation. So I called him back and said, hey, you know, my situation has changed. And if you guys are still interested in it, he was like, yeah, absolutely. We're still interested. Nothing's changed. Um, and that's when I first heard of them. And followed along, you know, series of interviews uh, before I accepted my offer. So what was it that attracted you then? Because obviously, there, I guess at that time, there would have been lots of different companies out there hiring, um, lots of different options. I guess the, the the concept of what Salesforce were looking to achieve would have been different to, you know, what a lot of companies at that stage were looking to achieve. So did you see it as a, an amazing opportunity or was it was it just another job at that point? And was there an element of risk to, I guess? I don't think there was an element of risk there because I I was being hired to do more of what I was already doing, which is integration, backend systems, make a CRM platform, talk to the to the core systems backend and things of that nature. But um, I really didn't know much about Salesforce or or you know. Uh, Silicon Valley or you know San Francisco or startup culture. Like I had like, I. I'd say I was, and it probably worked somewhat in my favor and somewhat against me, as in I was completely ignorant of, you know, how to approach this. This, um, But what really interested me uh, was the uh, interview process didn't seem to be overtly focused on, can you write like this weird algorithm to do something in Java? I'm like, I don't see how I'm actually going to use that in my daily life, right? Um, I'd spoken to a couple of other firms and one firm was like, um, write a Java program to figure out how, uh, how many different, you know, uh, phone numbers you can create, uh, you know, from a phone keypad. I'm like, uh, I, I don't know, like what's, what's the, what's, what's the function here? Because I know phone numbers are not generated sequentially. I had worked for a telco in my, in my life prior and I knew how phone numbers get assigned. So I was like, this doesn't actually make any sense. But at Salesforce was not like that. Like they were very focused on how I can, they were really focused on my, you know, EAI and systems integration work. And that was something I was very comfortable with. Um, so it just seemed like, you know, a good thing to do. And I, I mentioned visas. Um, 
I had gotten to a point where I was like, I'm going to try and maybe focus on my career. Uh, and if things don't work out and I have to go to a different geography, Australia, New Zealand, or, you know, somewhere else, Singapore, I think Salesforce was just getting ready to start an office in Singapore at that time. It was a really attractive proposition for me, Canada. I was like, if I'm not going to get my green card here in the United States, um, I might as well be with a company that has some international exposure. That way, I could probably just go like relocate to another one of their uh, offices and continue building my career. Um, that actually was really the big driver for me to take my my first job, the, the job at Salesforce. And uh, so you were hired. So integration and uh, was was your kind of niche at that point. So you were hired as a developer. That was your first role. No, I was actually hired in the role of a technical architect. Um, but um, as far as leveling guides go. Um, it was, um, I don't even think Salesforce hires people at that level in anymore uh, in ProServe. Um, or they did for a while, but they don't anymore. Um, but yeah, it was pretty far, you know, down the the, the leveling guide for me. Um, so yeah, I mean, my, my first year and a half, um, I wrote code C Sharp. Um, remember when I started Salesforce, there was no Apex and there was no Visual Force. There were S controls and you could essentially write your own web app and expose it using a custom tab. Um, my, my, on my first Salesforce implementation, I actually did 85% of my work was writing .NET and C-sharp code for a credit card processing form, which you couldn't do natively on Salesforce at that time. So It's crazy, isn't it, when you think like that? Because yeah. obviously everyone yeah. now knows Salesforce for what it is, but you were there. Like you said, I didn't even know that there was an Apex back then. Yeah, there was no Apex. There was no Visual Force. Uh, we, you could write code in JavaScript using something called S controls. Um, so you could, if you had to build some custom UI, you could build it in JavaScript. And S controls allowed you to call the API, the Salesforce API. Um, but other than that, I mean, if you had to do something custom, uh, let me put it this way, right? If you had to write a batch process, you had to write it on some other platform and then ETL the data in and out of. Uh, out of Salesforce, there was no Apex batch. Um, so uh, yeah, I've, uh, yeah, I've, uh, that's that's how I started my career. Um, in fact, my first two engagements, I did very little actual Salesforce work. I did some of the usual setting up a custom field and workflows, and you know, um, there was no. I don't even think there was no process builder. There was, it was just workflows and field updates. Um, so, um, I was a huge fan of outbound messaging when I first started my career at Salesforce because it allowed me to send a message to a backend system. Then I, I could write code in multiple languages on the middle tier. So it, it was a lot of fun. Wow. So you, you were hired as a technical architect and obviously that was in 2007. So what, what, um, other roles, um, did you hold within your time at Salesforce? Um, I mean, I, I I got promoted a couple of times, and you know was, the work was similar, but you know in, in uh, larger in scope and potentially importance. Um, but um, eventually, at one point, I expressed a desire to start managing people and you know expanding my career uh, prospects from rather than just be an individual contributor. Um, so uh, that happened. Um, I eventually managed a pretty decent sized team, about 80, 85 architects before um, I left uh, professional services and joined uh, the platform product team uh, as a product manager. Um, and that was, again, like I went from managing people and client facing work to now, you know, building internal. And it was pretty deep into product management because um, I uh, started my product management career at Salesforce uh, doing uh, some CDC uh, the CDC API or change data capture API. So that required me to, you know, take a look at the Salesforce platform under, you know, under, under the covers of the Salesforce platform to see the guts of how it was built. And um, it, it's amazing what they do um, on the platform. Uh, and um, it gave me a newfound appreciation to how easy it makes the life of other people, uh, you know, when, or at, especially the people who use it to, you know, at their enterprise. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing how things are built under the covers. So, Yeah, it's a pretty unique view, right? So many people yeah. work in the ecosystem, but so few mm -hmm. people get to see under the bonnet. Yeah, which I, which I did, um, enjoyed every bit of it, but um, 
it was a weird kind of timing. I had become, a, you know, I had gotten my green card along the way, you know, but I'd spent at that point close to um, nine. I was at my 10th year, almost at my 10th year anniversary. And then um, an ISV uh, came, you know, knocking and they were like, we'd love you to consider coming and taking on a role with us. And I, w- I wanted to learn the different things. Like I got, I was getting, I, I'd done a lot of prosub work. I'd now done like about nine, maybe 10 months of product management. So I kind of was getting the hang of it. Um, but this was a an opportunity to take on more of the responsibility of delivering the overall end-to-end product. Um, and uh, so I took that opportunity and I left Salesforce, I'd say about a month, maybe a, a a few days less than my, you know, like my 10th anniversary, I actually left Salesforce to go join this ISV, um, which was which was interesting in itself. So, And you went back to Salesforce? I did. I did. I, I spent about six months at the ISV and then took a two-month break uh, to use some personal reasons. Uh, someone that I had worked with and I respect a lot, at Salesforce, uh, asked me if I'd be interested in coming back. Um, and I said, sure, why not? We definitely have a conversation. Um, had a conversation and decided to come back um, into a similar role. It was ProServe, but it was um, specifically leading the financial services vertical within professional services. Um, and um, that was you know, an interesting four years as well. Um, so yeah, I did co- I did go back to Salesforce and spent another four plus years there. I did get my ten year anniversary out of the way. Um, for those of for those people in the ecosystem, Salesforce uh, calls the ten plus years uh, club as the Coa Club. So um, I did make it to the Coa Club. I got a bunch of uh, jackets and bags and all that fun stuff and. Um, was I think actually one of the last Coa Club um, events that they used to have in San Francisco with the black tie dinner and all of that. Uh, I remember going to pretty much the last one because, yeah, it was the last one because after that, the next year we were all in lockdown and I don't think they brought that thing back uh, yeah. after that. So uh, who knows, it might come back at some point in the future, but you never know. Hopefully, because yeah, I imagine it's uh, it's so, well, it's some achievement being with a business like that for ten years. So it's great for people to be able to enjoy and to celebrate that. But if you look across your two periods at Salesforce, would, would, like, is there like one major achievement that really stands out amongst them all? One of the things when you're an employee of Salesforce really is you kind of uh, seed the spotlight to your customers and your partners, and rightly so. I, I think that's the right way to do it. Um, so. Not a lot I can publicly talk about in terms of the work that I did, uh, but um, I'd say being part of the team that brought the the CTA certification uh, to the world was uh, would definitely go down as one of my top three. Um, uh, the second one would probably be taking on delivery responsibilities for what was probably the largest Salesforce-led uh, ProServe implementation, and that happened to the last two years of my my life at Salesforce. Uh, and then the third one is really all the relationships that I built. I mean, I know it, it started as a CRM company and now is a platform and there's a lot of things to Salesforce today, but um, some of my best friends are people I met at Salesforce. Um, I met my wife, uh, who I'm married to right now at Salesforce. So um, there's a lot that Salesforce has given to me, uh, both professionally and personally. Um, but I'd say the relationships, uh, the CTA, uh, and probably, you know, working on one of the largest Salesforce-led, you know, ProServe implementations was probably three big things. Uh, there's a lot more, I, you know, that we did, but uh, some things you can talk about, some things you can't, so. Well, I've got three questions all, all that cover each of those. So just the first one, when you say the largest Salesforce led, oh, I appreciate you can't talk like um, dollar value or anything like that. But in terms of uh, when you say largest, are you talking user base? It's actually largest in multiple ways. It's user base, it's complexity, it's uh, somewhat of a regulated industry. Um, and from a Salesforce professional services standpoint, it was a, a program that, they 
that the Salesforce ProServe team was leading, uh, at least mm -hmm. for the first you know two years of of that implementation, maybe three years, um, because I left I, I think towards the last towards the latter half of that implementation. But really, um, like from the day the contract was signed to actually standing up, uh, you know, the entire team of architects. Uh, solution architects, business architects, getting the developers, you know, onboarded um, and handling client expectations at the same time and, you know, making sure that whatever we design and, and, and you know, develop will actually scale, working with the product management and engineering organizations because I don't think they had ever, um, they had had some other large customers, you know, uh, before, but um I don't think any of their large customers use the platform as extensively as this customer uh, did when we started the engagement. And, um, you know, I, I'm still aware of the engagement today, but um, they're really using everything, right? I mean, uh, there's very few customers that of that scale that use pretty much every part of the product stack, including MuleSoft, Marketing Cloud. Like, I think the only thing they don't use is Commerce Cloud, honestly. They use pretty much everything yeah, else wow. that there is to use uh, in the Salesforce ecosystem. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, now I can see why that was uh, such a big project. Yeah, it, it, in multiple ways, it was, I, I would say in any which category you look, it was probably the largest, um, you know, uh, for Salesforce uh, and one of its very first, so. Yeah, wow. And then on, on the CTA uh, part, so um, you mentioned you were involved in kind of standing that up. What what changed for you both professionally and personally when you became a CTA? Obviously, the Trailhead team today with Suzanne and everyone else, they do an amazing job. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Karen Hennessy. Uh, I don't think she's at Salesforce anymore. She's, she's moved on to other things. But um, she brought this amazing team of partners and internal employees together together. Um, I was part of a pretty large team. We, we put the questions together. I remember writing a whole bunch of the multiple choice questions and answers for the integration section. But honestly, when I got my CTA, um, nothing actually changed for me um, the first maybe year or two years because nobody really knew what it was, right? Um, and I, I believe I was like the ninth CTA uh, to be certified. For me, the, the like, there was nothing about CTA prep, like none of these things, like there are study groups nowadays and there are people that give up like two years of their life to, like, for me, it was like, I got an email saying, hey, you want to sign up for the beta because you helped write some of the questions? I said, yeah, sure, why not? And I remember I was actually going, taking my family out on vacation uh, and we were flying out on a Saturday, a Sunday morning. And I actually drove like two hours on a Saturday morning to a test center. And because it was beta, you actually had to do like 225 multiple choice questions to get past stage two. Uh, it took me like two hours to get through the whole thing. And um, and then when I was on vacation, I got an email saying, uh, we'd love to you know, get you uh, in and face the panel. And here are some of the dates available. I remember that was the only time I actually logged into work on my vacation because I got the email on my handheld device and I had to go find a place with some better, you know, uh, cell phone reception so I could connect like my, uh, the the 4G puck that I used to carry um, because I had to send a, a request for travel approval to my boss saying, hey, I, I need to go to San Francisco for this. Like, can you approve it? And I just walked in, you know, I, I saw a room, the panelists, like, eight nine people i knew about i knew five of them um the four that i didn't know i was like okay whatever we'll see how it goes um and that was it but two years after i got my cta is when people started realizing what it meant for the ecosystem and um i think not being able to get as many through is what finally asked forced people to start taking like wait a second why are only you know I don't know, like 35, 40% of the people who appear or pass, like what is what, what what is so cool? What is so amazing about this? But fast forward all these years, I, I think being a CTA panelist, uh, you know, uh, and uh, a, a, a panel judge as well as a CTA and using it in my career, it just really helped me become a better problem solver, right? Like um, it also helped me learn the art of pattern recognition because at the end of the day um unlike other platforms where pretty much you can do whatever you want 
Salesforce has a sandbox you can play in, so to speak, right? Uh, and there are things it does to prevent you from, you know, getting out of this little box. Uh, and really, as an architect on the working on the Salesforce platform, um, it's just pra- it it makes you better at looking at the problem and saying, oh, here are the four things I need to do to address this issue for this customer. Uh, and it really helped me become a lot better at that. And it, it helped me solve things a lot faster too. So I think more than the CTA, the process helped me become a better architect and a technologist. Uh, and that's something that I'm super grateful for. Yeah, that's consistent with what a lot of people that I've had on the, the show, um, especially now you say people invest two years of their life. Like, Obviously, the outcome is what everyone wants, but the reality is going through that study, that practice, that drilling through that process makes you a better architect, no matter what the outcome. Out- outcome is not in your circle of influence. So That's it. That's it. And then your, your third point was about relationships, right? And, um, and the relationships you've, you've, you've built and, uh, and kept from your time at Salesforce. Now, your last role, or one of your last roles, I think you were VP uh, services lead, um, which... I imagine the size of the the U.S. market, you know, the the talent in the U.S. market would have seen you work with some of the very best Salesforce professionals in the world. Um, what what really stood out to you about the best? Like, what what did they do? What 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 could they do? Or how did they approach things that was different from your average person? I would say um, the first thing they the best on this in this ecosystem do better than anyone else is really not assume that there's only one way to solve a problem, right? Um, I, I've seen a marked difference between people who take a problem and say, oh, we got to build all of this stuff on the platform versus someone looking and saying, I don't think Salesforce is a good use for this particular problem statement. Let's figure out the best way to do this or solve this problem. Parts of it may be at, on, on the Salesforce platform, but parts of it may not. And that's what the best do better than anyone else. Um, so that's, uh, I'd say that's probably the biggest differentiator. Um, and then <clears throat> being an employee, uh, obviously ha- you have some advantages. Like you can, you can look at things, uh, you know, uh, under the covers that are not exposed to the outside world. You have somewhat of a better access to, you know, engineering and product leadership. Not necessarily by a l- lot, but enough that if, you know, stuff gets really uh, serious, you probably have a, a few more eyes to help bail you out um, or teach you a, a lesson without it coming at the expense of the customer. Um, and um, I'd say that's those are two pretty uh, great advantages, of, you know, being uh, in ProServe with Salesforce uh, while working on that platform. And I think that's true for any company, right? You could say the same thing if you were at IBM or Oracle or uh, Microsoft or, you know, it's just that having that backend access is is definitely uh, makes a huge difference. And is it the case of like the, the, the best operators knew when to leverage that? The best operators knew when to pick up the phone and phone a friend, right? Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of times, phone a friend is just a Slack message or uh, pre-Slack, it was Google Chat. But um, yes, y- you knew when to ask for help and you knew that you know, uh, someone would have faced this before or something similar before, right? Um, you-, you alluded to the fact that I was you know, a services leader um, the last year and a half of my career at Salesforce, I actually brought all of the technical architects in North America together from the various acquisitions, um, you know, both from uh, the, the prior model metrics acquisition to Commerce Cloud being acquired, Demandware. So I had a team of like, you know, about 600, 650 people odd rolling up into me geographically, North America, Canada, US. Um, and if you were someone on who worked on that team and you were faced with this technical challenge on on the platform um you'd probably have four different answers to how to solve that problem under 15 minutes of you asking the question so beyond relationships just that having that um you know that that knowledge uh, you know and that that epicenter of all of the you know knowledge in one place I was a huge advantage and I I always encourage people on my team to use it, 
right? Uh, and then share it back, right? It's it's not it's one thing using the knowledge that you get from a, a colleague or coworker, but you also want to give back, um, and um, that's I, I always encourage that. So, so you uh, obviously, yeah, you you leading huge teams and working across major major projects, and then you you um, took the decision to leave Salesforce and and start your own business. Um, which I can imagine day one was very different to what you'd been experiencing uh, at Salesforce in terms of uh, having to set up your own desk and uh, and go from there. So what was that transition like and what was the thinking behind that decision? Uh, the transition wasn't necessarily bad or difficult because uh, being in ProServe uh, as long as I was, I always had a remote job. Uh, um, I always chuckle when I see this these massive uh, you know, Twitter and LinkedIn discussions on remote versus hybrid versus everyone has to be in the, I was like, this was our life for like 15 years before it became a real thing for most other people. So for me, really, it was like, I used to wake up and, you know, saunter on to my work from home desk anyway, unless I was, you know, getting, you know, getting on a plane and, and that had stopped the last two years of my career because of, you know, uh, the pandemic and no one was flying anywhere and customers realized like, yeah, you can pretty much get the similar or better productivity and not have to spend all this money on travel dollars. And so it was like, you pretty much worked out of your home office. So that transition wasn't too bad. Um, on the business front, really, yeah, it's definitely been interesting because when you don't have the the big logo behind you, uh, people definitely listen to you because they look at they look you up on LinkedIn. They're like, okay, this person probably knows some a little bit of what they're talking about. Uh, but there's a huge difference between that and then getting a signed contract. So um, that's you know uh, that's definitely been a, a very interesting ride. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't be here today without, uh, you know, my co-founder, Jason Stone, who's also a CTA and spent a lot of his life at Salesforce. Um, but, you know, together, uh, I think we're headed in the right direction. So, so you, your business um, is uh, is in the, the banking space, right? And I believe your, your vision is um, or you, your idea is for um, vertical CRMs for regulated industries, mm -hmm. and your target market is is banking. So why why do you think there's a need for these regulated uh, industries to have vertical CRMs? Sure, uh, my target market today is our banks, community banks, and credit unions. I would say under five billion in assets under management or AUM. Um, there's a there are a few reasons why. One, when you're a a customer of that size, you're obviously not going to outspend, uh, you know, the J.P. Morgan Chases and the Wells Fargo's of the world, right? Like, I think J.P. Morgan Chase is on track to hiring like I don't know five thousand engineers or something next year is what they claim to want to hire. Like, a small bank is not going to hire five thousand engineers. So, uh, but at the same time, in order for you to be able to serve your consumers. Uh, and be their preferred uh, financial partner of choice, you really want to be able to compete, uh, you know, with better products, better service, and that should become your differentiation. Um, so how do you give a better product and a customer service and a differentiated experience to your consumers without having the money to spend uh, the billions of dollars on uh, on tech? Uh, the only way you can do that is by, you know, going and acquiring newer, you know, software platforms that help you do these things in one place. And that's what we aim to build for a bank slash credit union. Um, it's our goal that, you know, in our target segment, a customer should be able to get up and running uh, on our platform in under 60 days with as little customization as possible. And they shouldn't need to. We are not trying to build a um, uh, a platform that allows a customer to do, build whatever application they want. If they want a low-code platform, you know, to do something else, um, there are many, many platforms to choose from. That's not what we want. We we want to build marketing, sales, and customer service for a, a bank or a credit union under five billion with one login in one place with one database. So that's our goal. And um, we, we feel that will help these institutions go a lot faster. Uh, and 
actually be able to punch above their weight class, so to speak, when it comes to competing against the larger banks uh, for their customers' share of wallet. So the the next point I think will surprise a lot of people because um, you mentioned you uh, you and your business partner both Salesforce CTAs both with a long uh, history in in working for Salesforce working with the platform. But your business isn't built on Salesforce, which, and you've kind of answered this in a way um, when you were talking about the best architects earlier, um, you know, they look at other things. But to everyone listening to it, it would have probably been the obvious choice for you to go and build on Salesforce. Why didn't you do that? Um, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one, um, it's, I don't even think we could even if we wanted to, right? Because Salesforce doesn't really have an ISV program that allows me to build marketing sales and customer service in one place for a segment of customers um, and then offer that up as, as a platform license. So it's just, it's just not even possible even if I wanted to. So that was the, pr- the primary reason. Um, the second reason really was we worked long enough at Salesforce to know um, what it's great for. Um, and in our situation where we hope to have multi-tenant platforms with uh, a multi-tenant platform with many customers in the future, um, things like release management and you know uh, rolling out upgrades and stuff like that. Um, I spent about six months, I told you, at an ISV. Uh, so I've, I've kind of lived that life for a little bit, even if not as much as I would have liked to. Um, we knew enough that it was not really something that we wanted to take on. Um, my co-founder and I both come f- have similar backgrounds uh, prior to our life at Salesforce. And really for us, the ability to control our destiny in terms of how to roll patches out, do upgrades, what we can f- roll out, what we can roll back. Um, we really wanted you know, uh, total control over that and not be uh, at the mercy of the, the metadata API, so to speak, um, which is really not very complete if you think about all of the other platforms like Marketing Cloud and, and so on. Um, so it really was not a, it, it was not something that we, we could have actually used to build a long-term business. Now, <clears throat> What we lose out is obviously the reach of the app exchange and and the ability to go and tell everyone, yeah, we're built on Salesforce. Like, you know, we, we are secure. We are, it's SOC 2, Type 2 compliant, GDPR, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we, there are things that we gave up, uh, but we willingly gave them up because long-term, uh, I don't think you could actually run a uh, fully... Uh, integrated marketing, sales, and customer service platform just because it it kind of cannibalizes some of Salesforce's business too, right? Like in, in, not that we are in any way, shape, or form a competitor to Salesforce. Uh, I wouldn't even begin to think about that uh, uh, for many, many years down the road. But um, the reason why Salesforce wouldn't allow it is ob- for, for obvious reasons, right? They want people, I mean, Salesforce wants their customers to use service cloud and financial services cloud. And, and, and th- those are all great, but the scale at which we are doing it for, for the customer segment that we are going after, they really can't afford uh, software licenses um, that allow you to do all of that. So price is also a, a huge differentiator, right? I mean, we are talking to, we're talking to banks that have four branches and 60 employees, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they are not going to be able to afford like $100,000 worth of licenses every month. The, the solution to solve their problem looks a lot different than a Salesforce or a HubSpot or even Dynamic CRM. It, any one of the big enterprise ones, right? It's They require a different type of solution. Uh, and that's why we cho- chose not to build on Salesforce. It makes a lot of sense, yeah. And and uh, you mentioned uh, banks looking to hire five thousand engineers and things like that. What what's your stance on building uh, like a team for for your startup world, your your product world? Like what what's your approach? What do you think is an optimal team? I've been spending a lot of time, you know, uh, following people on LinkedIn, Twitter, doing a lot of reading on you know what this will look like when it, it gains traction and. You know, we we start landing multiple customers, and we have to run a support team, etc. Um, I'm a strong believer in hiring uh, talented individuals and giving them responsibility for 
decent areas of the platform. Um, I'd say we are probably going to err on the side of hiring fewer people, um, you know, especially from an engineering standpoint, but spending more money on automation and and, and tooling. Um, we will be faced with the age-old SaaS um, challenge of growth um, and hiring, you know, uh, people to sell and solution engineers and so on. Uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get, get to it, but I don't think this is an industry that will uh, necessarily that necessarily lends itself to product led growth. So we are going to have to invest in sales, um, and there we'll make the appropriate investments when, when the time is right. Um, but for from an engineering uh, you know uh, standpoint, um, I'd say it's probably going to be small teams of people who are empowered to make decisions um, as long as they follow the frameworks that have been laid out, you know, for us as a company. Uh, we, and we'll always, always focus on that. And I guess um, final question for anyone that's interested in the business, like what, what are you excited about for the future of December Technologies? What, what do you see that future looking like? Well, we we are we are at advanced stages of conversations with multiple banks and credit unions now. We're about you know, 18 plus months into our journey since we first put hands to keyboard. Um, and we're getting to the point where we have an MVP that we can actually uh, deploy to our, our first customers. But what I'm really excited about is um, all of this coming together on one platform in a shared database, right? It, it's, um, it, it's one thing to have a lead and then, you know, convert that lead into a quote and an opportunity and things of that nature. But it's another thing to have the application come into one one database and you know if that application doesn't get uh, converted into a client, uh, it's then going to launch into its own you know marketing campaign. Um, and that's the that's the other part, right? Like everything that we are building is being built for banks. So when you log into our platform, you see clients, you don't see customers or this. It, you log into the if you log into the credit union version of our platform you see members because credit unions have members and banks have customers or clients so that those are all the small things that we are looking at um you know integrated uh, to um you know back end banking systems um it'll be pre built like if you are uh, a customer that has uh, let's say a core banking platform from fiser We'll have, you know, working with our connector partners, we'll have pre-built connectors to Fiserv. So you're not going to have to come in and stand up, you know, a brand new integration platform and, you know, start doing things from scratch. So um, that's really uh, the exciting part. Uh, and then we are obviously, you know, AI is the, is, is, is the phrase uh, or the place to be in. Uh, but everyone asked me that question uh, do we have an AI strategy? We do, but really for us to execute on our AI strategy, we are first going to have to get this industry away from PDF forms and actually have online data collection and acquisition. So it's a little bit multi-step, um, and but yes, definitely um, there are things we are working on both for document recognition, document generation, things of that nature. Um, some of the more you know, easy to do things with AI today, like, you know, helping people write emails, uh, things of that nature we are working on that are exciting. But um, yeah, there's there's a long way to go for this customer segment before we can have a true AI strategy uh, that will make that will make a meaningful impact, right? It's, it's one thing to say we have AI. It's another thing to say we are having, we're going to make meaningful, impactful, uh, you know, changes to someone, to a banker's life using AI. So... Yeah, yeah, interesting. Well, look, I'm I'm really excited to see uh, the the business evolve and uh, and yeah, excited to see where where things go. If anyone that is listening wants to reach out, pick your brains about anything throughout your career, um, yep. lessons, experiences, um, journey, where's the best place to find you? I'm I'm on LinkedIn, uh, or uh, you can yep, so hail space Sikora, you, you can look me up, um, or you can try and you know follow me on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is kind of awkward uh, uh, because Twitter used to implement the 140 characters. I called myself abbreviated talk or A B B R E V talk. So um, yeah, I, I'm I'm not active posting, but I'm an active watcher on 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 Twitter. Uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me, uh, and I'd be more than happy to 
you know, give you, uh, you know, my, my two cents. Um, yeah, just don't ask me for, you know, customer names, customer lists, uh, that will get, that will <laughs> oh, get you blocked. So, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Well, thank you so much. It's been uh, been a real pleasure to have you on the show and to hear more about that journey that you've been through in the ecosystem and, and everything that's to come with your business. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, Ben. And uh, I look forward to continuing to work with this ecosystem and eventually building our own ecosystem uh, when it comes to CRM. Thank you. Mm-hmm.